Okay, good evening. We are starting week number two. Um, we are going to have four more days in this week. And uh, as I was saying at the last week, we are going to have like, or we are going to feel like we have short, short time in these courses, because if you can see, we are starting the week number two. And we are going to end this week um, in uh, three more days. And then we're going to have a week number three and then week number four. So we are going to have like a very short time. And it is not like we are going to feel very long um, a time or something like that. So we are going to start the week number two right now. And we are going to begin with the with the phrase that I have for you every week or every uh, beginning of week. And we are going to see what are the topics that we are going to develop um, today. And also we're going to, um, we're going to see the section number three because we are going to, to uh, to develop that part. So we are going to wait a little longer for the other because it is almost eight and you know that we are beginning in 755. So we are going to wait a little bit for the other participants to come to the meeting. And um, we are going to begin with the first part that we are going to develop in this session. But I will, um, I mean, I, I'm going to um, share the screen in which we have the document to see the phrase that we have for uh, this week. So let me put the screen because you need to see what is the phrase for today? So we have here the phrase that we have for this uh, session and also for this week, because you know that I like to, to share this kind of sentences with you at the beginning of the of the week. And this one said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. So in this case, we are talking about that uh, if we want to have a good future, if we want to have all of the things that we are dreaming about, we need to create our own future. In this case, we need to work very hard for that future. So in this case, remember that we are working in, because in this case we are learning English and this is a process. And you know that, and sometimes it's kind of hard. Sometimes you feel like um, you want to give up and something like that, but you know that this is for your future. So in this case, we need to create our future. We need to work in our future. And we need to um, do all the things that we need to do. And in some cases, we are going to feel very, very tired, but we are going to have a reward at the end of the process. So in that case, don't give up and complete or do all the things that you need to do to complete your future. So the last week, we have a lot of topics that we were developing during the uh, four days that we were working. And you know that we have a document in which you are going to find all the information that you need about the topics that we were developing the last week. And the first topic that we were um, working was describing problems. We were talking about what is a problem, the two different ways in which we can describe a problem. Uh, we have some structures, some examples. 
Then we were talking about needs, plus German or passive infinitive. Then we have a house improvement. This is the, the, the exercise. Also, we were talking about present continuous passive. We were saying the structures of this, um, this part. We have present perfect passive again. Then we have the usage of this one. We were talking about the reduction of the words and in which cases we can like do the reduction or something like that. Also, we have some uh, conversations. In this case, we have this one that is what can we do in which we were talking about the problems and the solution of these problems. Um, and this is the, this part is the last one and that is an infinitive phrase or infinitive um, clause. That is the last part that we were um, developing. But we have this one that is the, um, the reading activity that we are going to develop in this session. But in this case, we are not complete. We have just eight participants and it is supposed that um, we are going to read this uh, paragraph uh, because you are going to practice your reading. So in this case, I don't know if I am going to go first for the intro video of the section number three, or if I read this um, this article because we are not complete. So in that case, I'm going to read the article and then we are going to see the intro video. See, that's that's the thing. I'm going to, to read the article and then we're going to see the intro video because we are not the whole group. So in this case, we have this article that is called The Threat to Kiribati. Look at the picture. What do you think the threat of Kiribati might be? In this case, we are like, a guessing about this topic because in that uh, question is telling you that what do you think the threat of Kiribati might be but we are going to read this article and we are going to see what is the answer for that question that we have there in this case we begin um, reading in this case you can practice your reading while I am reading the article because in this case it is a practice that you have on the platform. This is not an exercise because in that case, you can look into the, uh, into the, 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 the word that you have there. And it says that this is just for a uh, practicing and for um, helping you to improve your reading skills because you know that we are uh, learning a new language and in this case we need to read also this is not just to talk this is not just to listen and understand what others are saying in this case we need to improve the four macro skills that are uh, speaking listening reading and writing so we need to know or we need to practice reading we need to practice writing, we need to practice speaking, and we need to practice listening because we need all of those skills to improve in our process of learning English. So we're going to begin reading this article and it says, the people of Kiribati pronounce Kiribati. In that case, you can see what is the correct pronunciation of that word. Kiribati, like that, are afraid that one day in the near future, their country will disappear. Literally several times in the past few years, the Pacific Island nation has been flowed by sudden high tides. These tides, which swept across the island and destroyed houses, came when there was neither wine nor rain. The older citizens are 
Kiribas say this has been happened before. Kiribati consists of 33 island scattered across 316 kilometers of the Pacific Ocean and near the equator. They are particularly threatened by high tides because none of the island of Kiribati reaches more than two meters above sea level. What is causing these mysterious tides? The answer might be global warming. When fuels like oil and coal are burned, they release pollutants that trap the heat in the Earth's atmosphere. Recent temperatures create more water by melting glaciers and polar ice caps. Scientists say that if the trend continues, many countries will suffer Bangladesh, for example, might lose one of one fifth of its uh, its land. However, the coral island, a nation of the Pacific, like Kiribati, and the Marshall Island, will face an even worse fate. They will be swallowed by the sea. This will be everyone's loss. Coral formation are home to more species than any other place on Earth. The people of these nations feel frustrated, the ocean on which their economies have always been based. is suddenly threatening their existence. There are no easy answers. These nations don't have a lot of money so they can afford expensive solutions like sea walls. And they have no control over pollutants which are being released. Many by large industrialized countries. All they can do is to hope that these countries will take steps to reduce pollution and therefore global warming. And um, I just want to say that I am kind of sorry because I am not using my glasses. So I, I am like um, working so hard to see all of the words that we have on that image. But in this case, we're talking about also the pollution and problems that we have around the world. And if you can remember uh, the beginning of the section number two, in the um, intro video, they were talking about that problem. They were talking about the pollution, they, they were talking about uh, some uh, problems in nature and all of that thing. So in this case, this is the end of the a section. So in this case, we have this topic in which we are talking about uh, what is happening in Kiribati, that they are having like troubles because of wo uh, global warming, because um, they, they say that uh, like it's kind of hot and um, is, is going to melt all the, the glaciers and polar ice caps. So in that case, it's going to have a lot of water. And in that case, that kind of island are going to suffer all of the problems because they are going to have this kind of um, a accidents, or we can say the, this um, type of, of tides. Um, and also it is saying that they are going to have something even, even a more worse, that is, um, in this case, is the loss of the coral uh, formation that you know that is very, very important for the uh, for this kind of uh, places. So in that case, they are going to have a lot of troubles if, if we don't do something um, to, we can say to get better in that in that kind of topics if we are not talking about um the problems that we have around the world so in that case it's not like we are going to forget about the problems that we have but in this case we are just using these kind of um topics because you need to put into practice all of the information that you are gaining to understand what is uh, written in this type of articles.
I was saying, I think I was saying to you that uh, when you are learning English, you are going to find a lot of um, different topics that you need to, to read and you need to, to understand. And in this case, one of these uh, kind of topics is this one, talking about nature, talking about uh, disasters, talking about uh, the ocean, talking about um, global warming and all of the things. So you need to, to gain uh, information about those topics too, because you need to, to put into practice all of the things that you are going to read in those uh, articles. It is not like you're just going to read about the topics that you decide to read. In that case, it's just for fun. But in real life, you need to read all of the things um, that you are going to put into practice because in some cases, you're going to talk about that uh, kind of problems. Maybe you have the opportunity to talk about these kind of problems with other people around the world because that is not like a dream. You can do it. You can find people from outside that wants to talk about this kind of uh, uh, topics. So in this case, you need to, to read again this article because you have on the platform and you need to mark all of those words that you are not sure uh, what is the meaning or um, the phrases that have like kind of nonsense for you because it's kind of confusing and think about the context of uh, the phrases and try to understand all the information that you have here on the article. So that was the part of the reading of the article. So in this case, you have this article on the platform and now we are going to um, enter section number three. We're going to see what is the uh, information that we have in the intro video. This intro video is talking about something very specific. It is um, not related to the English learning process, but it has like keywords that we are going to use during the um, we're going to use that, that words or those words during the week. So in that case, I need that you put attention to the video and the things that they are going to say in the video because maybe, let's see, uh, maybe tomorrow, I guess. And no, for tomorrow is another topic. But let me see when we are going to talk about. I think on Wednesday we are going to talk about the topics that or the words that we were listening on the um, on the intro video. So I need you to put attention to the words that they are saying and something in specific because on Wednesday we're going to see what are those words that we need to put attention. So I'm going to stop this one and I'm going to go to the platform. So give me a moment. Because we're going to see the intro video of section number three. So remember that in this case, we are in week number two and you need to work in your uh, section number three. And you need to complete for the last day of this week. It is Thursday. So we're going to see and listen the information that we have in the, in the, in the intro video. So let's begin. And a step back.
so it's having some trouble. So give me a second. Okay, now it's time to listen the information. So pay attention to the video. And then we're going to begin with the topic that we're going to develop today. To watch this new intro video, try your best to understand what they are talking about. Good luck. Ballet to ballroom and salsa to swing. Learning to dance is one of today's hottest trends and tango dancing is the hottest of them all. Tango fever has spread all over the world. Hi, I'm Kevin Kane and once a month people come here to the Weeks Bridge in Cambridge, Massachusetts to learn tango. Hi, how's your tango lesson going? Oh, it's super fun. So why did you decide to take a tango class? I was just interested in dancing. And a lot of our friends come here. What's the best way to improve your dancing? Just by going to a tango club. And by practicing hard. Too. How did you learn to dance? By coming to class. And why did you decide to take tango lessons? Because I wanted to keep fit and have fun at the same time. Well, I took some lessons and I come here to practice. So what's a good way to improve your dancing? By practicing with a guy, but you have to find a good partner. Now we're going to talk to a tango instructor, Uche. Hi. Hi. Why do you think tango is so popular? I think tango is popular because it's very exotic and it's also very challenging for people. And once people learn something that they find challenging and it's very exotic, I think they feel very rewarded. Step six, back, collect, seven, and then instead of collecting, you actually switch your weight. What do you recommend for people who want to learn tango? I would recommend starting with group classes or private classes. And after you've learned the basics of tango, what's a good way to improve your moves? By going out dancing with the people that you've taken the lessons with, practicing at home, listening to the music, just feeling very comfortable with the music and then going out dancing again. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. How long have you been coming here? I've been coming here for about six years. Why? Because I love tango. And what is it about tango that you love so much? I think it's got great rhythm. I think it's got passion. It's a fun type of dance. Do you have any advice for people who want to learn to tango? A lot of people don't think they can dance until they get out here and try it. I think dancing starts by taking the initiative. Take a class. Do you prefer taking lessons in a studio or going out somewhere like this? I prefer going out and there's a different energy. It's more social, but there's nothing wrong with taking lessons. I recommend it. Why do you think tango is so popular? You can grow into it. You let your body move to the music and you create a dance with someone. And it's relaxing once you learn it. Do you have any advice for people who want to learn tango? It depends on how you learn. Some people learn best by taking classes. I learn best by watching and listening to the music and then getting brave and trying it a little. You know, learn by doing and practicing. Okay, I'm ready to take the plunge. How do I get started? It's not too difficult. Take this arm behind my back. This one up, now just start walking. That's perfect. <laughs> Try step to the side. Good. And a step back. Now side again. Hey, this is a lot of fun. You should try it. 
This is Kevin actually dancing tango from the Weeks Bridge in Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> So here we have the intro video of the section number three. And they are talking about tango, they are talking about dancing, but they are doing something um, that we are going to put into practice or that we are putting into practice when we are learning uh, English. In this case, we are going to do all of the things when we are learning something new. And in this case, it's not just when we are learning um, a new language. In this case, you can see that they are using um, this information to learn how to dance. But you know that, um, I think, I don't know if you can, think about the, uh, the elements that we are going to use for our topics or for the topics that we're going to develop in this week, because in that case, they have like, they were talking about that information when they are talking about uh, why people like to dance, uh, tango or something like that. But we're going to develop all of that um, elements in our section. So I was saying that we are going to see the elements that they are using in the video, and we are going to put into practice in our own process. Because you know that um, we are having like this process of learning English and we do something with that. And in that case, we are going to like um, we're going to make like a comparison of the things that they say in the video with the things that we are going to do when we are learning English. But in that case, we're going to do it on Wednesday because in that moment, we are going to have a, a specific question in which you are going to express something. So we're going to give that, that um, that question for Wednesday. So we're going to see what is the topic that we're going to develop today. And let me go to the document again. Because we are going to begin. So for the ones that were not here, when we begin with this, um, with this uh, session, um, just saying that we have this phrase for this week, that is the best way to predict the future is to create it. So we are creating our own future right now because we are learning something new. So the topic for today is, Intonation. We are going to talk about the way we produce or the way we, we pronounce the words. And you know that when we are talking, we have different ways to uh, pronounce the words. And in this case, it's not talking about the best way to pronounce a word or the way we are talking in English. No. In this case, it's just talking about um, the way we show our emotions through our voice. For example, when we are happy, we make or we sound um, different from when we are like angry. And also when we are like surprised, we have a different tone of voice. When we are like 
a scare or something like that. So in this case, we are talking about that. We are talking about the sound. We are talking about the emotions. And also we are going like to, um, in this case is, we are going to focus on questions and how we uh, pronounce the questions and in which cases we're going to have like this intonation and all of that things. Because in that case, you know that we need to know this information because we are going to sound more natural when we speak in English, if we know how to change the tone of voice and how to sound more polite and how to uh, ask questions and a lot of things. So we're going to divide this topic in this one that is the definitions. And we're going to have one, intonation, two, stress, three, tone, and four. Yes, we're going to have a four that is vocalization. So the first part that we're going to do right now is to talk about definitions. We're going to define what is the intonation, what is the stress, what is the tone, and what is the vocalization? Because we need to uh, understand that they are very different and we need all of them when we are talking in English. So we are going to gain information about the topic and then we are going to explain. We are going to talk about uh, um, examples uh, of intonation, the musicality of the language. And we are going to see some examples also in which way we can change the tone of voice. But first, imagine that we are like angry and we say, shut up when we are angry, shut up. It is different when we are like making a joke. Oh, shut up. It's different the tone of voice and the way we are like using the expression. So in that case, we're going to divide that information. So number one, we're going to see what is the explanation of those elements. So the this one is definitions. And number one, is intonation. So what is intonation? It says that in phonetics, the melodic pattern of an utterance, it conveys difference of expressive meaning. For example, surprise, anger, delight, and it can also serve a grammatical function. Intonation is primarily a matter of variation of in the pitch of the voice. In such languages as English, it is often accompanied by stress and rhythm to produce meaning. Tone is also a form of pitch modulation, but the term describes the use, the use of pitch to differentiate words and grammatical categories. In many languages, including English, intonation distinguish one type of phrase or sentence from another. The different intonations a person can use to say, the cup of water is over there, demonstrate this grammatical function. When a person begins with a medium pitch and ends with a lower one, falling intonation, this sentence is a simple assertion. In that case, the cup of water is over there. The cup of water is over there. But when a person uses a rising intonation, high final pitch, it is a question. The cup of water is over there. The cup of water is over there. And in that case, we have um, just one sentence, but the way we use our voice is telling us what is that sentence. It is just an affirmation or if this one is a question. The cup of water is over there. The cup of water is over there. The cup of water is over there. 
So in that case, we are um, adding more like volume to the end of the sentence. But I'm going to write the um, explanation for you because you need to have all the, this information in your uh, documents. So let's begin with this explanation. So in this case, we're going to talk about the number two, that is a stress. A stress is another of the elements that we can say, uh, that we can see in this uh, kind of topics. So a stress in phonetics, intensity given to a syllable of a speech by a special effort in utterance resulting in relative a relative loudness. This emphasis in pronunciation may be merely phonetic. Example, noticeable to the listener, but not meaningful. As it in French, we have like, um, we are like making comparison with different languages. And in this case, as it is in French, where it occurs regularly at the end of the word or phrase or it may serve to distinguish meanings as in English, in which, for example, a stress differentiates the noun from the verb in the word permit. So in this case, the stress is just the, uh, is the intensity that we give to some words that in some cases is just like um, relevant to the way we are speaking, but they don't have like, or they are not very, very important. And we need to put attention to the words. In this case, it's the way we speak. And we give that intensity to some words to when we are explaining something. And in some cases, we need to make like emphasis to those words. And, and we say like, 
um, in a different voice and we are sound like more loud in some cases. So that is the stress. This is just um, something phonetic, but it's not like we are going to have different rules to, to talk about the stress of the words that in this case is just to put intensity to some words when we are talking. So there we have the, like, in this case, is, um, the most important parts of that uh, specifications or definitions. So in that case, you know that in this um, use number two or this definition number two that is stress, is just the intensity given to a syllable of a speech. And also this is, a, or this emphasis in pronunciation by, may be very, or be merely phonetics, and it occurs regularly at the end of the word of a phrase. And also it may serve to distinguish meanings. So in that case, it's just to, to distinguish meaning of some word, because you know that uh, in English, we have um, words that we can use for two or three, th uh, or three things. The same word is functioning as different things. And also they have different uh, meanings depending on the context in which you are using the words. So in that case, when you use the stress, you are uh, like adding uh, that uh, little difference from one word to the other. Then we have number three, that is the tone. And this one say in linguistics, a variation in the pitch of the voice while speaking. The word tone is usually applied to those languages called tone language, in which pitch serves to help distinguish words and grammatical categories. For example, in which pitch characteristics are used to differentiate one word from another word. That is otherwise, identical in, in its sequence of consonants and vowels. For example, men, in this case, we're not talking about English. In this case, we're going to have Chinese. Men in Mandarin Chinese may mean either deceive or slow, depending on its pitch. So in this case, imagine in those languages in which you have like very, 
a similar way to write the words. Um, and you know that they have a different way to, to uh, produce the language. So in that case, um, they have or they are identifying the meaning through the tone of the voice and the variation of the pitch when you are uh, speaking in not just the context. They are using also the way we um, use or pronounce the words to differentiate some, uh, some of these meanings when they are talking. And we're going to see number four, that is the last one of these four different uh, categories or uh, definition that we have here, talking about like, but uh, we have another thing about the tone and it says that in tone languages, Pitch is appropriate of words, but what is important is not absolute pitch, but relative pitch. Tone language usually make use of a limited number of pitch contrast. These contrasts are called the tone of the language. The domain of the tone is usually the syllable. There are two main different types of tone language. That is the registered tone or level tone language and contour tone languages. Register tone language use tones that are level. In this case, we have an example. They have relatively a steady state pitch, which differ with a regard to being relatively higher or lower. This is characteristic of many tone language in West Africa. In counter tones, language at least some of the tones must be described in terms of pitch movements such as rises and falls or more complex movements such as rise falls. This is a characteristic of many tone language of Southern Asia. So in this case, we are saying that the, the tone is more like used in another languages, but not in English. Also, we have like the use of tone in English, but uh, that is not the best or the main part of the production of the language. And we have the number four, that is the last one, that is vocalization. This one is any sound produced through the action of an animal's respiratory system and use in communication. In this case, it's a, it's a animal a respiratory system, but in our cases is through our respiratory system. So in that case, it's producing the sounds. It's making sounds through the throat, the mouth, the nose, and all of that a respiratory um, system that we have. And that we use in communication. In this case, we communicate through words. In the case of the animals, they um, communicate through different kinds of sounds. 
vocal sound, which is virtually limited to frogs. In this case, we're going to talk about animals. Uh, cocodrillians and geckos, birds and uh, mammals, in sometimes the dominant form of communication. In many birds and non-human primates, the adult uh, repertoire comprises a number of different calls used to indicate territorially aggression, alarm, pride, containment, hunger, the presence of food, or the need for companionship. Burson, the most intensively a study of animal vocabulations, consists primarily of territorial and mating calls. So imagine that we are using also this kind of a system in which we produce sounds through our respiratory system. And those sounds are not like the sounds that produce animals to uh, talk about food, to talk about that they need um, some partners or they are like protecting something or they are angry or they are hungry but we are using also that system to make sounds and also to form sentences using words to express the same things. When we are angry, we talk and we have a different tone of voice. When we are happy, when we are uh, lonely and all of that things. So we have complex system to create sounds to communicate with other people. And also we make sounds to make affirmation of negation, like, mm-hmm, uh-huh, mm, oh. Those sounds also are, or are functioning um, for communication because we are making affirmation with that kind of sounds. So there we have the four different uh, definition that we have for this uh, topic of the intonation, but also we have uh, more information in the, in this says um, in a speech intonation is the use of changing, rising, rising and falling, vocal pitch to convey grammatical information or personal attitude. That is the thing that I was saying at the beginning, personal attitude. Intonation is particularly important in expressing question in a spoken English. For example, take the sentence. When does the meeting start? When does the meeting start? The word start, including the question mark, rises up or comes up in your voice when you utter the word. So in this case, when we are making a question, also that was uh, something that I was saying, when we are going to begin with the topic of intonation is that we are going to focus on questions. So in this case, we have the question, when does the meeting start? In this case, we're not using the intonation. When does the meeting start? But when we are going to make a question, we're going to say, when does the meeting start? When does the meeting start? And we are rising, we are um, leveling up the tone of the voice to make the question and to let people know that we are making a question. So I'm just going to write this uh, definition or this part of the, of the information that I have for you because we are going to end this session in four minutes or three minutes, something like that. So we have this part. 
in speech. So there we have the information and also we have uh, the example about uh, the uh, way we, we pronounce the questions. We are going to continue with that uh, topic tomorrow because we have um, more information and more examples about the way we pronounce some words. And also we are going to see how can we change the tone of the voice depending on the context or the moment in which we are talking. So we have a kind of um, short information for tomorrow and we are going to have another topic for tomorrow. So this is the first part of the, uh, the topic of the intonation because you know that in this case, we're talking about intonation because we need to sound more natural when we make questions. That is the part. We need to, to sound more natural when we pronounce question in English. So tomorrow we are going to see more information about this part. We are going to see some examples and then we are going to see the other topic that we are going to develop for uh, tomorrow. So we are going to have like two different topics tomorrow and some exercises that we're going to perform tomorrow also. And we are going to, let me, this one, yes. So we are going to end the session here and we are going to see each other tomorrow in session number two of this second week. So have a really good night and see you tomorrow. Good night, teacher. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.